Welcome to the Meb Faber Show, where the focus is on helping you grow and preserve your wealth. Join us as we discuss the craft of investing and uncover new and profitable ideas, all to help you grow wealthier and wiser. Better investing starts here. Meb Faber is the co-founder and chief investment officer at Cambria Investment Management. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Cambria's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Cambria Investment Management or its affiliates. For more information, visit cambriainvestments.com. Today's podcast is sponsored by The Idea Farm. Do you want the same investing edge as the pros? The Idea Farm gives small investors the same market research, usually reserved for only the world's largest institutions, funds, and money managers. These are reports from some of the most respected research shops in investing. Many of them cost thousands and are only available to institutions or investment professionals, but now they're yours with the Idea Farm subscription. Are you ready for an investing edge? Visit theideafarm.com to learn more. Welcome to the show, friends. We have an extra special guest today, Mr. Michael Covell. Welcome to the show. Matt, thank you for having me. Where are you talking to us from? I am talking to you from the great city of Saigon in Southeast Asia. Right, have you been Have you been put there for a while? Have you st- stayed put? Have you been moving around? What's uh, What's the, What's the well, story? I've been jumping around Asia for the last three and a half years and make it back to the States some. So yeah, I like this part of the world. Podcast listeners, you may not know this, but you owe a massive debt of gratitude to Mr. Covell. And the reason being is that we put off doing this podcast for many months, years even, largely because of what I consider to be the operational headache of getting it going, started up, all the recording equipment and editing and stuff. And eventually, I emailed our buddy Covell and said, hey, look, you've done this going on. Have you crossed 500 episodes yet? I'm close, but maybe 10 away, something like that. And, and so I said, look, you've done this enough. Any suggestions? And I asked, also emailed our buddy Barry Ritholtz and said the same thing. Do you have any suggestions? And he put me in touch with, with some friends that helped get the, the show up and running with uh, the equipment and all the to-dos. So uh, you are kind of this, this show's beginning. So uh, a, big, a big thank you. And so listeners... You need to go over and you can even pa- pause the podcast right now and go subscribe to Covell's podcast. He's had all sorts of interesting people, not just trend followers and investing, but Nobel laureates and everything else in between. And also, so now a little a little more background for those listening that are not familiar. Now, uh, you have a pretty varied background um, besides podcaster, a fellow writer, and you've done how many? Five books? Four to five. I, one, one was kind of like, I don't know, a book of data. So I don't really count that one. So four officially. Okay. Well, I, I have about three books that are more pamphlet length than books. So I, I claim five books uh, <laughs> and actually have what a credit as a, as a movie producer. Didn't you put out a, a short documentary as well? Yeah. Beyond short, uh, 90 minutes or so, six, seven, eight years ago during the financial crisis. And I was broke, right? Broke, uh, what's full name? Broke the new American dream. I actually believe that the vast majority, well, that's maybe a little unfair, but many people actually want to be broke by their actions. Oh man, that's that's a topic we're going to hold on to for a little bit and come back to. But but let's, you know, for listeners who aren't familiar, and, and listeners, I say this with no bias whatsoever, but you absolutely should pick up a copy of his book, the, the kind of probably your flagship book, I'm guessing, which is Trend Following. And also, Mike writes at the domain trendfollowing.com. But Trend Following, Learning to Make Millions in Up or Down Markets, uh, what is his most updated edition, 2009? There is, but there is a new one coming in seventeen. I was, I was saying, it's about time for a for a new edition because uh, I have also the edition prior to the 09 earmarked, and and we got a few copies in the office. All right, so why don't I, we've had a massive amount of interest in trend following in general from our listeners, and it, you know, I was mentioning to you earlier is that it's a little surprising to me because. I've been writing about this for over a decade now, and you know maybe the podcast has kind of drummed up some new listeners and, and maybe a younger generation, but I thought we'd let you talk just a little bit about 
that world and kind of a little bit about maybe the book or kind of the origin stories on trend following. And then I'm sure after five minutes, it'll veer off into a totally different direction, but kind of kind of giving you the floor now to, to chat a little bit about that world because people I know are super, super interested in it. I still go back to probably the mid 1990s learning about trend following for the first time. And I'm sure it was the turtle story. I'm sure it was the Market Wizards books. And look, most people don't realize those Market Wizards books that Jack put out, a good number in the first two series, the first two books, were trend-following traders. I mean, your Ed Sakotas, your Larry Heights, your Bruce Kovners, your Richard Dennis's, your Bill Eckhart's. I mean, these guys were all just pure trend-following traders. And that kind of led me down the rabbit hole. What, what is all this? Who, you know, look, I, I want to be Buffett, but, but you know, I'm, I'm 26. How am I going to become Buffett? It's just not going to happen. There was too much information for me to know with my background as a political science major. So I stumbled into this trend following realm. And I just started knocking on doors, getting people to talk to me, whether that was early on Jerry Parker or a guy named Bill Dunn. Bill Dunn, who's got a 40 plus year continuous track record trend following, one of the most amazing track records that you can ever look at. I mean, it's really Buffett-esque, speaking of Buffett. I went down this rabbit hole and I just started getting inside and I was like, wow, this is just so damn interesting. And what was so cool about trend following is you could go back and you could look at these track records. You could say, oh, wow, okay, these traders, the turtles, the turtle traders taught by Richard Dennis and Bill Eckhart. Oh, Bill Dunn. Oh, John Henry, who owns the Boston Red Sox. You could look at their track records and just eyeball correlate up and say, oh, wow, they are basically making and losing money in the same months. Well, of course, if you know what's going on in that particular month, which was usually pretty easy to figure out for the most liquid markets, well, lo and behold, you've got something quite interesting that so many of these people are doing generally the same thing to get these great results, which were at the time very under the radar. Now you roll forward to today and you've kind of had a shift from assets and trend following in the US more to a London centric situation with the likes of David Harding uh, at Winton Capital and Aspect Capital and uh, AHL Man and uh, Ewan Kirk at Cantab. So you've had, you've had quite a shift, but it, it's all the same thing. And it, it, I was writing something the other day about Jesse Livermore, and it's like, it really goes back to that. We don't know what's going to happen. We can't make a prediction worth a damn. The market starts to move, whatever that market might be. We get on board and we don't get out until it goes against us and we have an exit signal. And, and so you, you mentioned a lot of names and I'm sure the podcast listeners will be familiar with some. I mean, Dunn, what a, what a fun track record he has because, I mean, you have to, I mean, you could obviously dial it down with volatility if you want, but he's had tons and tons of these 30, 40, 50% drawdowns over the years. And then, then the track record just keeps compounding and compounding. You know, I actually looked up and we'll come back to this this trend following story in a second. I actually looked up in my emails to try to find the first time we corresponded. And I was actually trying to convince you to write a book in 2008 because I love the turtle story. And we'll talk about that in a second. And I said, there's been about five groups that have acted sort of as the the godfathers of certain areas of investing. And so the the turtle story, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, another one is Julian Robertson's Tiger Management. And he's spawned dozens of famous hedge fund managers that grew up that, you know, people call them the Tiger Cubs. And then there's a few others, Goldman Sachs, when when Ruben's uh, bond trading desk, and there's a lot of famous investors that came out of there, Eddie Lampert at ESL, but the guys that also started Eden Park, Farallon, Perry, et cetera. Soros has had about a dozen famous hedge fund managers come out of his. And then, of course, another one that's kind of in your world, which was Commodities Corp. And that one had a lot of famous names like Louis Bacon, Paul Tudor Jones, Ed Zakoto, who you just mentioned, and a few others. And I was always fascinated. And so I, I was the origin of this was I was emailing Mike and I was saying, hey, you're a great writer. You should do this. You know, he's like, who are, who, who are you I tr- emailing me and telling me to write these books? And so I, I'm still giving you that idea that, that one day would love to see a, a kind of who's generated the most money managers. But let's talk specifically a little bit about the turtles, because that's a story that you're pretty familiar with. And, and for the listeners out there who probably have no idea what we're talking about, maybe just a broad overview, what that experiment was and, and kind of what, what, what happened. Absolutely. 
you know, going back real quick to what you just said about the tiger cubs, I grew up with one of the tiger cubs. I won't mention the name, but we played baseball together as a kid. And then we got older and I reached out to him and I said, Hey, were you the guy on the team that literally was in right field and struck out every time? He's like, yeah, that was me. I was like, well, it kind of turned out all right for you, huh? <laughs> That's great. So, That's funny. But no, the turtle story is great. And it kind of gets into what you were just talking about is these silos of people, these groups that maybe had a, a core leader and they were taught and they taught other people. And so one of these groups, these famous uh, teaching groups would be the turtle story. And for those not familiar, there was this great trader in the 1970s, started on the floor in Chicago, Richard Dennis. I think he made his first million in 1976 on the floor at the age of 25, 26. By the early 1980s, he was probably, if you go back and look at accounts, he was probably the biggest trader there was, except for Soros. You know, Dennis had assembled by the early 1980s, 200 million. What's that in today's dollars? A lot. Uh, he was around 37 years old. I mean, that's just crazy, crazy, crazy money in like 1982, 81. So right around the time the Trading Places movie came out, him and his partner, who had not had the same level of success at that point in time, but his partner was quite brilliant. His partner said to them, said to Rich, after they went, his partner's name was Bill, said to Rich, after they went to see trading places, they said, hey, Rich said to Bill, you know, we can do that. We can take someone out of nowhere and make them a trader. And, you know, Bill is like, no way, man, you're a savant. Look at you. You're 37. You've made 200 million. Uh, you know, this doesn't translate. You're, you're, you're one of a kind. They made a little bet. I don't know the exact dollar amount if there was. They put ads in the paper to hire trainees to prove this little bet. They basically hired uh, approximately 20 people over two years. This is the first class would have started early 1984. They traded after getting two weeks of trend following instruction. They traded for Rich Dennis, this group of 20 novices, and we're talking waiters. One was a guy who wrote for Dungeons and Dragons, an accountant. I mean, a really diverse group of people. One guy was a drug dealer. And so they trained these folks over two weeks, put them down the street in an office in Chicago, and they said, here are these trend-following rules. Go at it. Three and a half, four years later, the group on aggregate had made around $100 million, and this is 1988, right around the time the Market Wizards books were coming out. So you roll forward, they all left the embrace of this kind of teaching experiment, this group of 20. Most of them went on to start a, a fund of some sort. Most of them had a track record. You know, I'm sure many of them, many, many of them made uh, many millions of dollars. Maybe they didn't stick with it as a fund manager, but it was just a great story because it was nurture. It was nurture beating nature. I mean, it's, you know, it's Anders Ericsson 101. You know, practice, having rules, sticking with it, having a mentor. And it was just a great story to inspire. Hell, it inspired me. I'm sure it inspired you. I'm sure it inspired many people listening. Because once you know that someone else can do it, well, then why can't you do it? That never leaves you. Once Once that light bulb goes off, you're like, wow, okay. Yeah, I hear the story. And I imagine a lot of listeners today are the same way. And I get so much... FOMO, just like like fear of missing out. We're like, man, I would have loved to have seen that newspaper ad when I was 20 or whatnot, because what a grand experiment that would be. And, and it didn't work out for all the traders, because there was also some that, you know, were, for whatever reason, unable to follow the rules, right? Like it wasn't, you know, the, all the, the subjectivity and emotional challenges of following the rules it was something that even then even when they said hey, here just follow these there were, there was a subset that couldn't do it right do i remember correctly i don't know if they couldn't do it or they just elected not to do it but i mean overall when i got into writing my book the complete turtle trader i found this guy soul waxman at barclay group and he had been a tracker of cta performance going back decades and I didn't know he had this, but he had the inside internal uh, trading performance histories of the turtles while they worked for Richard Dennis. And once I saw those numbers, I was like, well, you know, really, they all did well. Now, once some of them left the embrace, you know, not all of them did well. And there were some stories that are in the, on the inside. There were, there were one or two that were trading different strategies or doing something different. But, but overall... The, the idea that you could take a group of people with no real trend following experience, give them a set of rules, which had some discretion in the sense of how much they could risk or perhaps their portfolio selections, but the same damn rules and turn them loose and find 
overall, except for volatility, the same kind of performance correlated at over 90%. Boy, that was inspirational. So and here's, here's a philosophical question for you, for someone who's spent decades in this world. The investment community, if anything, I feel like will will be attracted to performance and you know something that does work i feel like ends up attracting a lot of dollars over the long run and one of the oddities of our world is that you look back over the decades and you mentioned dunn's been around for 40 years and many trend followers have been around forever dating back to this the turtle experiments and i look at a lot of institutions out there the calpers of the world and these big real money pension plans, the Norways of the world. And I rarely see hardly any allocation to managed futures. So forget, you know, registered investment advisors, brokers in the US, because almost none of those that I ever talk to have more than 5%, if anything. Why do you think as a investment strategy, as an asset class, it's either A, not more popular, or B, why isn't it a larger chunk of most institutional investment programs? And maybe you have a simple answer, maybe you don't have an answer, but what, what, what are kind of your thoughts there? Well, you know, Daniel Kahneman wrote a great book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, and Nassim Taleb has written The Black Swan. And I think both of those books go straight at why most people are batshit crazy, including the respected institutional investors that might work for the government wearing bad suits. Uh, but look, really, in all seriousness, you mentioned drawdowns with trend following. You mentioned, you said, hey, Dunn's taking these drawdowns. And it is one of those scarlet letter type things that a strategy like trend following that knows from the beginning it will have drawdowns because there will be trendless periods and you will take many small losses. But that's expected. And what's really interesting is when you compare that to the institutional investor that just basically blindly allocates and says, we will trust at the altar of long only even if we know it's damn straight possible that the buy and hold strategy will give us 50% drawdowns. In the case of the NASDAQ, what, 16 years ago, a 77% drawdown. But those things are never talked about. But the scarlet letter of trend following drawdowns are talked about, even though trend following is a, a real strategy that expects it. So I've always found that disconnect interesting. And look, who the hell knows what's going to happen in the future? But could we all imagine a situation where U.S. stocks took a hit and then sat below water, sat below current highs today, 30 or 40 percent down for 10 years? Could we imagine that situation? Of course we could. Of course we can imagine that situation. And if you can't imagine that situation, then one really has to think, what kind of strategy do I want over the course of a lifetime? Now, I'm not telling anybody out there they necessarily need to go have the uh, risk profile of a bill done, but there are trade-offs in life, and not everything goes straight up. Yeah, I mean, and one of the things with the volatility is you can kind of dial in whatever you want. So someone theoretically that wanted half the returns in volatility profile done is just allocate half and allocate the other half to cash or or whatever, you know, short term T-bills or, or whatever it might be. I mean, it's it's been a really fascinating experiment because, Mike, I've been, you know, managing money for almost a decade and we are totally OK with lots of buy and hold type of strategies and, and just talk about them and say, look, you know, one of the biggest challenges, of course, is is sitting through the drawdowns, but that's the same for any strategy. And one of the kind of things that we said is, look, the best strategy for someone is one they can stick with. And so we ended up offering a, a new offering a couple of weeks ago called the Cambridge Digital Advisory, which actually the default portfolio ends up allocating about half the trend following, which is probably the highest I've seen as far as any institution or broad offering. But anyway, um, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting compliment. And, and going back to one of the reasons, you know, thinking about why wouldn't more people be allocating to this sort of world? So I went in, there's a website called Favstar, or maybe it's called Favstar, F-A-V-S-T-A-R. It's a pretty bare bones user interface website. But it's the only one that can do what I'm getting ready to describe that I can find. And it allows you to go in and sync your Twitter or someone else's Twitter. And Twitter is kind of a fire hose for me. It's, it's kind of a pleasant distraction. But for example, 
the, the curation is really bad. Like, I really don't care about the U.S. election or whatever, you know, pop culture thing is going on every day that 10,000 people are talking about in my stream. It's kind of like Facebook, like, but, but I'm interested, you know, I am interested in, in someone like you or, you know, any of my other buddies on Twitter that may have posted something last night that was fascinating. And Twitter doesn't do a great job of curating that. And so there's human curators. But I also was, have been looking for a service that will go out and say, hey, what is the most liked or retweeted posts amongst my the, you know, list A or list B or people I follow. And so Facebook is the only one that even remotely I know does it. There's another one, an app called Nuzzle. Anyway, I went and downloaded your 10 most liked and retweeted tweets. The first one doesn't really count because it's a photo that you had posted about three or four years ago of somebody's monitor set up with about 34 monitors. And, it, and it's a, just a great photo of the, kind of the ultimate trader setup. But you were like, if you're trading at home or office looks like this, my guess is you have ceased reality and of course sex. And it's just a great photo. But, but the second one is the one I was getting to, your second most liked retweeted. And it's a quote from a book that I guarantee you most listeners have never heard of that I've actually read, but recommended to me by someone else. And it says, all investment is speculation. The only difference is that some people admit it and some don't. And this was a, it was a book called the Zurich Axioms, which had been recommended to me to by a trader uh, by the name of Larry Williams, which the younger audience may not be that familiar with. The older audience certainly would be absolutely familiar with. Have you read that book? Do you remember that book at all? Is that absolutely a, it's Zur Zurich Axioms, right? And in that, and I, it, it may or may not even be in print anymore. I can't remember. I remember having a really hard time trying to find it last time I bought it, but I read it years ago. And it was just funny because I haven't seen anyone else reference that book in quite some time. But, but I think that quote is a great quote where, you know, a lot of people believe in investing and, you know, a lot of what they think is that there's this magical, like they deserve to get this magical return. And you know, they understand that, you know, there's risk involved, but, but they also think that necessarily that risk is correlated with return so that you're kind of guaranteed a higher return if you take more risk. And um, I thought this quote was so perfect that, that it hits right to the core of the comment, which it's all speculation, right? I mean, it, coming, coming down to the end of it, it's about making bets. It's about making intelligent bets, but making bets nonetheless. And how many people out there, maybe not on this podcast listening, but so much of the population hears the word speculation and they immediately think pejorative. It is the most beautiful damn word. I mean, it's awesome. I would give people an exercise, and I think you can go do this through Google Books. You can go back and you can access the full copy, full books back, I don't know, 1920s, 1910s, 1800s, a couple from the from uh, various British uh, catalogs in the 1700s, literally all about speculation. And I mean, you know, and when you read these old books going back hundreds of years, you know exactly where the Zurich axioms came from. Speculation is as old as the hills, and it is the lifeblood of anything. If you're not a speculator, you're brain dead. You're, you're not admitting the truth. Everyone has to be a speculator for every damn thing, every minute of the day, or you're losing. And who the hell wants to lose? I was, I was just in Canada giving a speech with another guy who wrote the book Dual Momentum, Antonacci, but he was giving a speech actually on trend following. And he was, reminds me of what you were just talking about because he was referencing some philosophers from like probably 300 years ago or 400 years ago that were talking about trend following and, and markets as well that I thought was pretty interesting. Speaking of modern day philosophers, uh, a lot of listeners probably have never heard the name Ed Sakota. And one of the cool things about Mike's book is that it has like a thousand quotes in it from investors and trend followers and philosophers, but a lot, but a lot of which you probably have never seen anywhere else. And I was highlighting some of these earlier when I was flipping through the book. And here's one that I think is fascinating that will probably hit a little too close to home for some listeners. And it's, and it's from Ed, famous trend follower individual. And he says, win or lose, Everyone gets what they want out of the market. Some people seem to like to lose, so they win by losing money. And I thought that was such a wonderful quote. Do you have any thoughts on that at all? Or is, is that yeah, something it's that... Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's life, too. I would say it's it, everyone gets what they want out of life. Like right now, if we really want to be 
brutal about it. You and I want to be doing this podcast. I want to be in Saigon. You want to be in Southern California. You want what you have in your life right now. That's what Ed's saying. You want it. And if you want to have really shitty performance in your account, of course, there's always some luck involved, but you have to have the right process. And that's what he's really getting at. And, you know, look, too many people don't think about this. They, they don't, no, no, I don't want to be a loser. I don't want to be a loser. Well, then hold on. What are you doing with yourself? What are your actions? So I, I agree with you. That is one of my, one of my favorite ones. And I have to tell you, if anyone ever gets the chance, maybe he will not open up. Uh, you know, he doesn't necessarily want to open up to everybody. And you became an, you become a name like Ed Sakoto. A lot of people come knocking on your door looking for things. But I feel very fortunate to have met him for the first time in 2001. And he was he was an interesting guy to meet. And I've met him many, met him many times since then. He's been on the podcast several times. But just a brilliant guy, a guy that seems to understand human nature in such a way that if you walk into the room with that guy, he can see through you. He can literally see through you. I don't care how smart you are or whatever. He just has a way of knowing where you are. And if, if you're not brutally honest with him, he, he can just see through you. It's one of the only times in my life where I've ever felt that from a human being. Just a really amazing intellect. And for, for a little bit of background, going back to the Market Wizards books where he is first featured, he trained a guy named Michael Marcus. Ed started at Commodities Corporation. He trained a guy named Michael Marcus, and Michael Marcus was the guy that really led to Bruce Kovner, you know, one of the wealthiest guys in the world who made his fortune as a trend-following trader. So there's a, there's a long thread that goes back to Ed Sakota influencing a tremendous number of people. A really, really interesting guy. Yeah, I, I'd met Ed when I was made a brief stop in Tahoe. I was living there for about a year or two, and I think the best way that I've heard describe Ed as, as pleasantly eccentric, but he, he is a very, uh, you, you see that's the, the cover. That's the cover. I think really, I mean, in true, uh, so many people have met Ed and I think they, they will take, they will hear only the eccentric part, but that honestly, it's the cover. Yeah. And the, you know, there's, there's certain people you meet and echoing your thoughts that certainly have, you, you know, immediately that the, that their brain has a lot of horsepower. And I think, uh, I think he was one, and he used to write a lot on, I don't know if he's still writing, I haven't revisited in years, he used to, to be a fairly pro prolific writer, I know, I know he still does some, but uh, he, he used to have, we'll link, we'll link in the show notes if, uh, if we, on some of his websites and works as, as well. And here, here was one last quote, and then we'll probably move on to some other topics, but he said, the joy of winning and the pain of losing are right up there with the pain of winning and the joy of losing. Also to consider are the joy and pain of not participating. The relative strengths of these feelings tend to increase with the distance of the trader from his commitment to being a trader. And I think he's, there's so many of these that people are going to have to probably hit rewind three or four times to listen to the full quote. Hey, and some of those guys too, like Ed, I will argue that even though a guy like Daniel Kahneman got the Nobel Prize for prospect theory, these traders in the 70s were executing, even though they didn't write the books and do the research, they were executing in real life, in the markets, essentially what he got the Nobel Prize for. It's great. And so we could talk about markets still some more, but I think some of your other experiences would be it really interesting to the audience because you've managed to carve out, a, like you mentioned, a lifestyle that you want and living as an entrepreneur in a different country, doing writing, giving speeches, doing the podcast now, which basically you get to talk to kind of anybody you want to. And, I, you know, there's there's certainly a lot of your podcasts that aren't, aren't necessarily even investment related anymore. Maybe you could just talk a little bit about the podcast and kind of what, what the plans are going forward. You're coming up on your 500th episode. Kind of what do you, what do you see for the next five years for you? What, uh, what, what, what are your plans? If you, if you, if you know, or if you don't, that's fine too, but uh, just feel free to take the open mic. Let me give a little background on my podcast. So well over 4 million listens I launched it in January of 2012 on a lark. I remember somebody telling me that it was a really dumb idea. And, you know, it kind of generated a couple hundred listens a day, da, 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 something, nothing crazy. Then I had Jack Schwager on and there was a real bump and went along that process talking to like-minded trend following traders, other traders. At some point in time, I wanted something a little bit different. I don't know why. I think it was, I, I don't know why exactly, but I, I got the idea of trying to get Dan Airely on from Duke, a behavioral economist, 
And he, I asked him in the summer and he said, well, I got to wait till, you know, the end of the end of the semester. So I had to wait like four months to get him. That would have been my first big outside guest. Along that same time, I asked Daniel Kahneman to come on and didn't get a response. And while waiting for Dan Airely, I asked Vernon Smith to come on, who also won the Nobel Prize, actually shared it with Daniel Kahneman the year they won. And Vernon Smith had done all these great market experiments to show our irrationality. And so I got Vernon on, and then I finally got Dan on. So I had these two kind of like my first two big outside guests. And then I went back to Daniel Kahneman. And I, I said, hey, you know, I've had Vernon Smith on. Of course, he knows Vernon. I had Dan Airely on. And he wrote me back and he said, hey, I listened to your podcast. And this would have been in 2014. He said, I listened to your podcast with Vernon Smith. I liked it a lot. Uh, I would love to come on your show. So, well, that's just, this is great. The most famous living psychologist is going to come on my small trading podcast. But once, once he appeared, I then just basically went to like TED Talks and said, who do I want? Because I'm now going to send an email out to people and say, I would like you to come on my podcast. Here's the list of my prior guests. I lead with Daniel Kahneman. And, you know, people would just, you could feel it while they didn't tell me this. I think people would feel maybe not that smart if they say no to an invite where someone like Daniel Kahneman had appeared. And that kind of just went down the rabbit hole of like, okay, now I'll just keep doing this. And I've gone down the list of almost every behavioral econ pro that I can possibly find. There's a few stragglers I need to clean up and get on the show. but And I've gone down the path of really diverse. For example, Jack Horner. Jack Horner was a paleontologist. He's the guy that was the brains behind the Jurassic Park film, the guy that Spielberg hired to be the consultant. And so I had actually met him giving a speech at a book signing in San Diego. So a year and a half later, whatever, I wrote him. I said, hey, I'm doing this podcast on trading. I've had some behavioral guys on. I know this doesn't seem like it's a match for you, but you have to come on. So Jack Horner appeared. And I just, you know, and then I would go down the path of like I had met Ryan Holiday a few years ago. And Ryan is a young guy who's written these great books on stoicism and stoic principles in the last couple of years. And I got Ryan on. And then one thing led to another, and I kind of met Ryan. I said, well, I'm going to ask Tucker Max, get Tucker Max on. And then, you know, one day Ryan contacts me and he says, hey, would you like to have Tim Ferriss on your show? It's just these, this kind of uh, organic, unexpected process. So if I describe my world of a podcast in the last four years like that, how the hell am I supposed to answer your five years ahead question? <laughs> well, you're, you're going to have already hit all your bucket lists. I mean, because you were mentioning the paleontologist. I know that that was at least, I don't know, a hobby or an interest. Don't, don't you own like a triceratops head or something? You know, a couple years ago, well, not a couple years ago, I mean, I don't know, dot com esque era, I, there was a, a group out of South Dakota that, that had the original. Uh, fossils and they were selling scale replicas of like uh, t-rex and triceratops so i bought the skulls these scale skulls and they're some of my favorite possessions actually really you know it's just it takes up the size of a kitchen table and they're the life-size skull of a t-rex i mean what better possession i mean it's not the real thing of course that's you know there's only a handful of those in the world. Most of the, the most famous is, is Sue in Chicago uh, Museum. But look, they are so damn cool. And one day I'm going to get the full. That you can get the full dinosaur. You can get the full T-Rex. But I think you need like 100 feet to display it and maybe 20 feet tall and 10 feet wide. So I need to get like a, I don't know, like a barn or something to set it all up in. All right, Michael. Quick question from Twitter. After 500 podcasts, you've probably learned a thing or two. Any suggestions for aspiring podcasters or about interviewing in general that you'd like to pass along? That is a heavy question. It is a deep question. And there's no simple answer. Let me give some perspective, at least for me. I feel like you have to start this stuff early. And what I mean by that is talking. I'm lucky. I ran for political office when I was 21. I made my first public presentation in front of a, a government audience when I was 19. So I was doing debates and interviews in my early 20s. That really started the process for me of making mistakes, learning how to talk to people in public, how to feel natural. I still remember the first time I heard my voice. I fucking hated it. I was like, wow, that just sounds terrible. I don't want to hear my voice. But I look back, those early experiences in my early 20s, those were huge. 
And also, let me compare it to, for example, something like Michael Jackson. And I'm not comparing myself to Michael Jackson. Or let me compare it to something like uh, Elizabeth Taylor. I'm not comparing myself to Elizabeth Taylor. But they were both basically child stars. Again, getting started early. This Anders Ericsson stuff, practice, practice, practice. So there is no secret with this. The earlier that you start talking, getting confidence, interacting with people, that's the trick. That's the secret, really. On the interviewing side of things, I got lucky to do a film, what, six, seven, eight years ago. And then I first started talking to traders in the mid-1990s. So I had this ongoing interviewing process for probably, gosh, almost 15 years where I would approach strangers and try and get information out of them. Never really planning to be, quote, on the radio. This was just my process. But I look back now and I realize this all helped me to do a podcast today, right? It's all connected in some way. Again, if you haven't read the book Peak by Anders Ericsson, that's going to probably be much more important to you than anything I might say right now about podcasting because it all comes down to practice. Some practical tips. Be yourself. If you or anybody else, if you're listening to Tim Ferriss' show, or if you're listening to James Altucher's show, how the hell does that help you? You can't be them. They are who they are. And they have the kind of experience that I'm talking about right now. They have it. And they've been practicing for a long time. Well, how the hell can you emulate them? You can't. You can only be yourself. And being yourself means being interesting, having something to say, being an expert in something having some foundation where people can go and read about you, understand about you. You've put a footprint down. You've left evidence that you've done some hard work and that you might be an interesting person. Now, still, that might all mean shit. Nobody might listen and maybe everyone will stop listening to me as well. But you get the idea. You have to, you have to jump in there. You have to have some grist, some, some meat on the bones, something that causes people to say, well, okay, this person, they've got some flesh there. There's some evidence there. I want to dig in. But be yourself. If you're anybody else, it ain't going to work. One last thought on interviewing. Questions. You got to read. You got to read smart people's books. If you don't read their books, if you don't know what they're all about, how the hell can you ask a question? And I'm sure everyone's listened to one of these podcast episodes where it seems like the guest is asking a laundry list of, what, 20 questions? And that list is going to be asked no matter what. Well, that's, that's not any good. That's not Howard Stern. I mean, Howard Stern's the gold star standard. Laugh if you hate Stern, but Stern is an excellent interviewer. One of the best, if not the best. And if you watch him, yes, of course, he knows the direction where he wants to go, but he can adjust on the fly because he is prepared. When I do an interview, I have several sheets of notes in front of me. But the trick is when you're listening to a guest give an answer, you have to decide in a split second, have they said enough? Is there something you want to ask as a follow-up that will add to the conversation? Or do you need to move the conversation along to the next topic and you have to do all this in a split second. Otherwise, no one's going to listen because you're going to sound like an idiot. And I guess potentially in some episodes, I've sounded like an idiot. But I try to judge myself by listens. And if people keep listening, I guess I'm, I'm hitting the mark to some degree. This is a really big overview, a big broad overview. And I hope some of my insights can help other people get started too. No quick, short answers, but you have to get in the game. You have to get bloody, dirty. Look at Meb starting right now, but he's got all these things that I've been describing. He's been doing for a long time, has that foundation, books, speeches. So it's a little bit easier for him, but I'd love to hear his perspective as well. Anyways, I'm rambling. I think everyone gets the picture. It's fun stuff, but tough stuff. But once you start, and if you get a little positive feedback, if that positive feedback loop starts, you'll probably never be able to stop doing these damn podcasts because they are fun. Here's the challenge. And I, I've kind of 
whined about this to you a bit where I said, all right, someone's coming to your podcast and this, this doesn't just apply to you, but it applies to any listener or consumer of content. And I struggle with this a lot. It's one of the reasons I started the idea farm, which was a curated research service. You know, we're going to send out the two best pieces of research I read every week. And it's, it's, but it was born out of frustration to where I said, look, I read dozens of white papers and, you know, book snippets and tweets and blogs every day. And it's this fire hose. Most of it is not interesting or not, not that useful. And, and now podcasts have entered the fray and, and, and so many people have quickly adopted the, the podcast listening but one of the challenges is that same thing is that someone comes to yours or or any of these other people you mentioned and we've talked about or even mine i mean there's only 20 but but still that's 20 hours worth of content how does one begin so if you were to tell them say hey new listener to Cobell, we're going to send you at least three new listeners tomorrow for listening to this like wh where should they begin or do you have any tools or suggestions because just starting at the beginning I mean, I know you've you've worked on this as a profession, but there's a handful of yours that you're probably like, yeah, that was probably a pretty lame podcast. So what, what, what would you tell people where to begin, what to do? I don't know about the lame thing. I always try and give the best that I have at that moment in time. And whether or not historically looking back, it was a piece of shit. I don't know because I don't really go back. But I always I always try and put myself in the in the frame of mind, whether it's a, an interview or a monologue, I have to give the energy. If I don't give the energy, no one's going to listen. They're just going to they're going to tune out. It could be your guest or just whatever. It just for whatever reason. I mean, it? look, here's two two guys that come to the top of my head that I really have loved: uh, Gerd Gigenrenzer, who wrote a book called Risk Savvy. Some other books. Uh, really brilliant German guy on behavioral econ, and Robert Allman, who basically won the Nobel Prize for game theory. And Amen, just to listen to him, an you know, 80 plus year old Israeli guy who has a math background that I can't even begin to decipher. You talk about horsepower. I mean, you know, you win the Nobel Prize for game theory, it's horsepower off the charts. I mean, he was colleagues with Nash. I mean, you know, this is just, you know, and, and shelling. I mean, you know, these guys were at the, the forefront of trying to figure out what to do during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And talking to him and listening to him to describe game theory in very simple context and talking about us, uh, the American uh, side and the Soviet side back in the day, having bombers in the air loaded with nukes 24 and 7 for 40 years. Now, on the face of it, that might look crazy. But from a game theory perspective, you had to have that. You had to have both sides know that they were willing to go to the edge to keep the peace. Now, there's a lot of math behind that, of course, a tremendous amount of math. But to hear Almond really talk about that and to hear Almond talk about vacationing in Switzerland and says, you know, why am I, and he loves Switzerland, well, you see, I'm vacationing in Switzerland. Why are fighter jets flying over us during the summer vacationing in Switzerland? Again, you have to display the force in such a way that the other side knows that you're willing to use it for it to be effective. That was just a really, you know, a great inspirational moment for me. And I'll share one more that I really loved. And maybe this is a, a side tangent of what you're not really even asking. But talking to Daniel Kahneman, I realized, okay, you know, it, I was so happy to get this great guest on. And the podcast felt a little slow. And he just didn't really feel like he was into it too much. But then I knew something about his early childhood. And I knew that when he was in Nazi-occupied Paris as a six, seven, eight-year-old boy, he was walking down the street during a curfew period. He should not have been walking down the street. And he was approached by a Nazi soldier. And, you know, he's like thinking to himself, okay, this is it. I'm gone. And the Nazi soldier brought him over and said, come here, come here, and put him on his knee. So here, you know, little Jewish boy, uh, not supposed to be out. And uh, the Nazi soldier says, hey, come here, come here. And sits him down and opens up his wallet and pulls out a picture of his son to share with Daniel Kahneman. And, you know, Kahneman said, you know, at that moment in time, I knew I wanted to study people. Now, look, I'm just a guy who's looking in on this experience, right? But this is how we all learn because I get to hear this story from the 1940s from this brilliant guy that everyone loves and respects. And I get to kind of 
feel it from him, well, that changes me. And now I, I get to share that with you. And that's what I love about the podcasting is you just, you get these, not only the content, because Kahneman has shared that story before, but the emotion of sharing it and hearing him share it, that's completely different. Yeah. And then that's a beautiful example. I mean, you definitely answered the question kind of unintentionally. And, and my, my point was kind of like to find that moment and to find that podcast. Kahneman's an obvious example because he's kind of a national treasure, right? So people out of your 500 were so... Well, well, Sally so Hogshead. Sally Hogshead, I loved. I love anything with Ryan Holiday. And so, and, but so, so one way, like, so this is my kind of my point is one way is to ask you and we'll ask you and we'll add, say, maybe 10 of our favorite or, and I'll grab my co-host Jeff and say, let's pick our 10 or 15 favorite Covell episodes to get people started. But it is kind of more of a, just a philosophical question of how, if someone was totally new to your podcast without having access to you listening to ours or if someone just started on tim ferris's podcast or is this a business is this a business idea we should figure out how well, to solve it, this it is but I, you know i've actually i man i've already been talking to libsyn I, I there's no way to other than human curating it that i know of to be able like there's no rate good rating system the the itunes per episode rating system is I mean, they could do something with it if they wanted. And the problem is they hold all the data and Libsyn holds the data. And I said, Libsyn, why don't you let me have the data and we can go, you know, start to curate the better podcasts and the better episodes. Well, and Meb, <laughs> I think the one solution here, too, is there needs to be outside networks because you're right. And especially when I can look on iTunes, I can see there's a handful of podcasts that, that attract a lot of great guests, but the hosts are terrible. And I'm not trying to say I'm all that or you're all that or whatever, but there are several out there that kind of are just putting out info porn. It's not really a good conversation. Look, everyone wants to have a podcast now. I get it. It's a great thing. But you want to have depth on it, too. And I think that's the real issue is how do you find a situation where if you know you're producing something that possibly has some good depth and you know other people that are doing it, the system's not set up to find that right now. Uh, I, I mean, I'm lucky I started four years ago. Seriously. And one of, you know, my, my classic example that I always go to is my, my morning newspaper is a website called Abnormal Returns. And I was actually hanging out with the, the author Tadas last week in Chicago at this Morningstar conference. And, but, it, but it's a great example. It's human creation. So he posts, you know, his favorite 15 links of the day about investing. And it's far more valuable to me. I mean, I would pay a hundred bucks probably a month for that service and he does it for free and it's vastly better to me than than any other way of accessing information but it's just that nothing really exists for podcasts i don't know listeners if you hear anything shoot us an email email feedback at the meb faber show and would love to feature it because i i'm i'm constantly struggle with the fire hose of content and this is just brainstorming here, but uh, it's it's. You, uh, hey, you need you need to leave the states. That's one way to avoid the fire hose of content. You leave the states. You live in a country where they don't speak English everywhere, and then all of a sudden, life becomes kind of like what I don't know the 1920s or something or 1910s. Everything's a little bit slower in terms of information flow, and then you're left with the own your own demons in your own mind to invent whatever you invent out of whole cloth right i uh I, when i was in when i was in <laughs> right. when i was in canada last week i did my first sensory deprivation tank have you ever done one of those float where you float in a bunch of salt water in the dark <laughs> no I've well, not. that sounds cool I, I got kind of bored pretty quickly i mean I'm, my you know everyone loves meditation and, and transcendental meditation and everything and you know for me it's i would probably much rather just take a nap and that's my version of it but for the i was i was trying it out in when I was in uh, Vancouver and liked it probably not something I would do again but but and my problem is not so much the fires I, I I still want to find the gems that I would love to read and love to find and you know I've kind of narrowed it down unintentionally you know, I'm kind of droning on about this topic but it's still something I really struggle with that would love to find uh, some more solutions to anyway by the way I, I don't love meditation I do believe in the moment of right now I think there's a lot there's a tremendous benefit to being in the moment of right now but I, I've never been able to get with meditation I do yoga maybe I get there through yoga and can clear my mind 
but I'm not one of these guys that can just sit down and do it. I've, I just can't do it. Yeah, I mean, it, there's probably a lot of ways to skin the cat with, you know, just hitting the reset button. And, and usually exercise is such a great one in any form. And for me, meditation, you know, I, I, I kind of struggle with it. But again, the ones where, where it's the app, like simply being where you can sit there and take basically a 15 minute guided nap or 20 minute nap seems to work just well for me. But but who knows? So what what uh, where else are you traveling? Are you you uh, is, is Saigon going to be home base for a while? What are what are the next plans? I am going to try try and make it to the states for november and december and i will actually be coming through your world i think i'm gonna i'm probably coming into san francisco and driving down the coast of san diego so that's the plan well they're gonna be down in san diego a bunch there's a couple conferences and speeches giving down there i'm heading to the caymans for a speech as well we might have to do an in-person podcast uh what any anything particularly you've been reading lately that you love or anything else uh, any other resources for our readers and and we may yeah, just i just i just read a book called i think it's called never split the difference by chris voss former lead fbi kidnapping negotiator and wow that that is you know he's kind of like a hard scrabble guy who used to be a cop then went to the fbi and he has put together this this thinking uh this negotiation thinking it's essentially uh cialdini put together in a more maybe even a more accessible way even though cialdini is very accessible great Great insights uh, in that work, for sure. And there's the other one, too. What's the algorithm book that I just read? Brian Christian uh, and uh, Tom Griffiths, their algorithm book that's out right now. Forget the exact title. Great book as well. I mean, that that is the it's that book is literally the foundation of understanding why a quantitative trading system works. Fabulous. Oh, good. Uh, I, I, I will add it to the show notes. I'll, I'm going to go it, look that nothing, up right it's after this. It's nothing specific about trading and we talk about this on our podcast episode but he is laying out the 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 computer science understanding you know whether it's caching or or robustness all these types of things that are that are just the foundation of of quant trading cool i uh i haven't read a whole lot that i'm super excited about one of our first podcast guests has a great reading list patrick o'shaughnessy that he puts out a bunch of books and he, re he reads ridiculous amount but he had suggested kind of of a fun fiction book called ready player one that if anyone is a child of the 80s or really experienced the 80s is a fun sort of virtual reality sort of science fiction book that uh, I enjoyed over the last week. All right, we're going to start to wind this down a little bit. Um, one of the questions that we always ask the guests, you know, something beautiful, useful, or somewhat magical that people may or may not know about. Uh, do you have do you have something for us today? I got a bunch of stuff. Uh, little things, little things that I love on my phone, Dropbox app, Fox News app. Look, I don't love the Fox News app necessarily because of the content, but what's great when you're traveling, there it's so difficult sometimes to get a live stream on a news channel. And if you have the Fox News app and you piggyback off any cable system in the States and you got a Wi-Fi connection, you can get Fox News live for free. So that's, that's great just to always be connected. Slack app, great stuff. Magic Jack app. You know, you've, you could have a, a, a stateside phone number that anybody can call anywhere you are. Great stuff. That's magic. That's magic. Jack magic. Jack app. Yeah. I don't, I don't and know. And so that basically one. you get like for me, I've got a 703 Virginia phone number. If you call me on it right now, it would ring in Southeast Asia. It doesn't cost you anything. It costs me $12 a year. Wow, that's pretty awesome. I, uh, yeah. you know, the, the the connectivity. I was watching the Broncos game when I was traveling in Japan this year, and I, the Super Bowl. And I said, being a lifelong Broncos fan, I said I cannot absolutely miss this. And I learned the the wonders of VPNs and same sort of thing routing because the, they wouldn't stream it. CBS wouldn't stream it in Asia, and so you just hey picked up a service you paid ten bucks for says you're in San Francisco and it was the absolutely most crystal clear broadcast and kept me from having to listen to it in Japanese and it was a one I I, I mean, knew this I mean I had news to me I'd never heard of such a thing anymore let me, let me give a let me give a couple more practical ones and then a few love ones for Great. me practical practical one I've seen you mention this but I don't think you mentioned one side of the coin you've talked about the global entry card which for is just a must however for Asia 
And I've had it work in Tokyo, Thailand, Vietnam, Taiwan, Beijing, Singapore, KL. The APEC card, the ASEAN uh, card is fabulous. I mean, I've landed at Beijing, 500 people in line for customs, and I've got my APEC card and I say to the, you know, where's the APEC line? And, you know, basically there's like two people in line. And so using the APEC card in Asia is basically like being a diplomat. It's fabulous. We, we used to joke in, in the office, I said, my first interview question, if you come in is, do you have TSA pre-check? Because if you don't, um, and you try and you travel at all, you're an absolute moron because you go into these cattle cars of hundreds of people. And I just had an absolute near meltdown when I was coming back from Canada and I go to the, the goes line or whatever it's called, the global entry. And the guy says, uh, you know, global entry only. And I said, yeah, you know, I got, I have a, a membership, whatever. He says, do you have your card? And I'd actually never been carded before. Usually you could just walk right up to the kiosk and go. And he says, no, you have to have your card and I didn't pack it and the trauma of having to wait in the normal line I mean it only took whatever this one wasn't terrible 15 minutes but I was so sad and depressed anything that will make the travel experience better it to me it's worth worth its weight in gold all right any more or was that the last yeah, one yeah, okay. yeah. keep going three, three, keep going three. I'm not gonna stop you Three, three. Well, you know, I don't, are you familiar with the APEC card, though? I mean, it's no. I mean, I, I have. There's, there's some um, of the global entry. It ends up translating to a few other networks, but I don't know if it translates to APEC or something else. For your audience, for your audience, APEC. It's for the ASEAN entry, and it is just if you travel anywhere in Asia and you don't have the APEC card. It, it's it's like what you're talking about the pre-check okay on the love stuff for me i mean as this has happened in the last four years give me fish sauce just give me fish sauce i mean it's uh, i i don't care i just i i'm now addicted to fish sauce give me pork and fish sauce I, two I, others I, I, thought, wait, wait, I, I thought i thought you were saying the name of it was give me fish sauce no, I, what, no, just, just fish just, sauce just saying, in general I don't care. so I mean, there's so many what do you, there's what so do you, many you, there's so many varieties i can't give one variety but i mean i've be, you know as a, as a as an american now in asia i've become addicted to fish sauce for sure you just put it on everything not everything but i mean it's just i don't know it's kind of and i'm not a guy that would ever use salt in the states so i guess this is kind of a an unfortunate development later in my life this is like the asian version of salt right i, I used uh i used an asian um david chang the uh the chef for momofuku sells a korean chili paste that, that's kind of like a korean ketchup on his website called sam sauce i'm probably murdering the name similar sort of thing when i have it it goes on every single thing i have till i run out and forget about it but that was that was one of mine from a prior episode all right keep keep going two more two more loves that i think are my my i have to have each day uh number two would be ituin tea so i have shipped in wherever i am in the world, I will have shipped in it twin tea from Japan, uh, just bottled tea. I know I'm, this sounds lazy, but I'm just addicted to the cold, unsweetened Japanese green tea, I T O E N dot com. Fabulous teas. I mean, I drink stuff that basically tastes like bass beer, but it's tea. Never heard of that. Yeah, great stuff. Great stuff. My number one love, and this is really tough because I just got engaged. Well, congratulations. But my number one love, my number one love will always be walking in the streets of saigon and i don't think this is ever going to change because when you walk the streets of saigon it's like no other city in the world and what it gives you you know in a place where it's always over 90 is it always gives you motorbikes everywhere right so you know a city of i don't know how many millions of motorbikes six million or whatever but if you think about walking in new york city and you see cars drive by you don't get to see who's in the car you don't get to see the model in the car, right? You might see her face if you're lucky. But in Saigon, you walk the streets, and all you see are mini skirts and heels on motorbikes. That doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. And that, even, even though I'm engaged, I'm sure my fiance would listen to this podcast, she would know why, even if I'm not doing anything, I still want to see. I still want to see. And it's the only place in the world like that.
That's beautiful. I, I love that one. The, uh, you've, you've won the award one for most prolific amount of uh, ideas for this, for this segment. And that last one uh, is great. I'm, I'm, it's on my list. I've never been to Saigon, so it's, uh, it's got to be on the to-do. Uh, great list. We'll add all those to the show notes. You've just increased the workload for my uh, co-host, Jeff, about two hours having to write all these down, which is great. All right. Mine is, and I just remembered this one today. It's a website, but it's more of a event. It's called Outstanding in the Field. And basically what it is, it's this traveling dinner where if they come to your city, so say Los Angeles, and it's a group that partners with local farmers and local chefs. So they'll grab a bunch of local chefs from the top restaurants, a bunch of local farmers. Then they'll host it in a beautiful location traditionally on a farm and they'll get a bunch of winemakers that are hopefully local some areas of the country obviously that's not possible but use local food have this beautiful dinner with dozens and in this case there was probably a hundred people on this local farm in la which by the way i had never even heard of that there was an actual i think it was called waddles farm and the tickets are expensive i mean i think a, a dinner is is over a hundred bucks it might even be 200 bucks but I, I ended up finding mine on Craigslist, of course, because I'm a cheap bastard. But but total mama's boy. So I take my mom, and they let you walk around the farm and give you free wine and appetizers. Then you sit down to a family style dinner in a beautiful location, and it's a it's a it's a memory or experience that certainly you know you're not going to do every month. But I know they have them, and it's a you go up on the website outstanding in the field, check it out. But that the one in San Francisco they do like on the beach in a hidden cove. So anyway, really cool um, nature style thing. Put it on the to do list. I don't think they travel to Asia yet, so you'll have to wait till. I sound I sound so uh, I don't know so perverted that my idea is looking at thousands of women in mini skirts and heels driving by on their motorbikes, and you give this nice story about tasting wine with your mom. I sound like a complete deviant. Well, my mom famously at this dinner, you know, she's a she was so, so classic uh, growing up, and particularly when I was younger, and and you know, we went to go sit down, and of course there was a a mother and daughter next to us. And so she immediately grabs my elbow, <laughs> sits me next to the, the cute girl so that I could talk to her instead. So great, great, great mom trying to set me up. But uh, but both great ideas. I, I love both of them. Mike, we're going to wind this down. Where we just hit the hour mark. Where can people find more information if they want to find out uh, your books, your writings, your movies, everything that you're up to? Where uh, Where can they find you? A smart domain that I registered in the mid-1990s, trendfollowing.com. That's that's perfect, man. They uh, we, you've had it since midnight, man. That's that's a good one. And so then you're also on. You tweet a little bit at Covell, and then the podcast, of course, on iTunes. What is it called? Trend following? Is it called trend following? Yeah, you can you can link it links off my website too. So you know this. You know the, if somebody wants to find somebody like this, it's pretty easy, right? Awesome. Well, look, it's been fun. I imagine we'll have you back on here soon, particularly if you come to the U.S. Uh, listeners, please. Re- Reach out, go listen to his podcast because we have Mike to thank for the origin of this one. Check out his book, which I absolutely love. Anyway, thanks for taking the time to listen today. Remember to send feedback and questions for the mailbag to feedback at the Uh We'll post this lengthy show notes for this episode and all other episodes at mebfaber.com forward slash podcasts. You can always subscribe to the show on iTunes. And if you're enjoying it, please leave a review. Thanks for listening, friends, and good investing. This podcast is sponsored by the Soothe app. We all know how stressful investing in volatile markets can be. That's why I use Soothe. Soothe delivers five-star certified massage therapists to your home, office, or hotel in as little as an hour. They bring everything you need for a relaxing spa experience without the hassle of traveling to a spa. Podcast listeners can enjoy 30 bucks to their first Soothe massage with the promo code MEB. Just download the Soothe app and insert the code before booking. Happy relaxation.